Mr. President, an honor to have you on the program. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. When you go to uh, the NATO summit, the big strategic issue is that Ukraine wants membership in NATO. Um, should it get membership in NATO? I don't think it's ready for membership in NATO, but here's the deal. I spent, as you know, a great deal of time trying to hold NATO together because I believe Putin has had an overwhelming objective from the time he launched 185,000 troops into Ukraine, and that was to break NATO. He was confident, in my view, and many of the intelligence community, he was confident he could break NATO. So holding NATO together is really critical. I don't think there is unanimity in NATO about whether or not to bring Ukraine into the NATO family now, at this moment, in the middle of a war. For example, if you did that, then, you know, we, I, and I mean what I say, we're, we're determined to commit every inch of territory that is NATO territory. It's a commitment that we've all made no matter what. If the war is going on, then we're all in the war. You know, we're in war with Russia, if that were the case. So I think we have to lay out a path for the rational path for Russia, for, excuse me, for Ukraine to be able to qualify to get into NATO. And we have, when the very first time I met with Putin two years ago in Geneva, and he said, I want commitments on no Ukraine in, in, uh, in NATO, I said, we're not going to do that because it's an open door policy. We're not going to shut anybody out. NATO is a process that takes some time to meet all the qualifications, and from democratization to a whole range of other issues. So in the meantime, though, I've spoken with Zelensky at length about this, and uh, one of the things I indicated is the United States would be ready to provide, while the process was going on, and it's going to take a while, while that process was going on, to provide security a la the security we provide for, you, for Israel providing the weaponry, the need, the capacity to defend themselves if there is an agreement, if there is a ceasefire, if there is a peace agreement. And so I think we can work it out, and, but I think it's premature to say, to call for a vote, you know, in now, because I, there's other qualifications that need to be met, including democratization and some of those issues. The, the, the short-term issue is, uh, at the NATO summit is Sweden. Will Sweden, do you think, are you optimistic that Sweden will be invited to join NATO relatively soon? I am. I am. I've met recently with a Swedish prime minister here. Um, Sweden is a, uh, has the same value set that we have in NATO, has a small nation, but has the capacity to defend itself, has, they know how to fight there, and they're, uh, and, and I think they should be a member of NATO. You know better than anyone, the hold up is Turkey. Turkey and Sweden is making adjustments in their law to relate to whether or not they these burn, have people burning the Quran. Well, they aren't Swedes that are burning the Quran, they are immigrants who are burning the Quran. And uh, that puts, uh, that gives an excuse and or puts uh, Erdogan in a tough spot at home. And so they're moving to stop that number one. Number two, um, there is a, Turkey is looking for modernization of F-16 aircraft, and uh, um, Mitsotakis in Greece is also looking for some help. And so what I'm trying to quite frankly put together is a, a little bit of a consortium here where we're strengthening NATO in terms of the military capacity of both Greece as well as Turkey and allow Sweden to come in. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's in play. It's not done. But you're hopeful. I'm hopeful. Matter of fact, I'm optimistic. You have news. The news is that the administration is going to provide cluster munitions to uh, the Ukrainians. These are weapons that 100 nations ban, including some of our closest NATO allies. Uh, when there was news that the Russians might be using it, admittedly, against civilians, your then press secretary said this might be the constitute war crimes. What made you uh, change your mind and decide to give them these weapons? Two, two things, Fred, and it was a very difficult decision on my part. Uh, and by the way, I discussed this with our allies, discussed this with our friends up on the hill. And uh, 
we're in a situation where Ukraine continues to be brutally attacked across the board by munitions, by these cluster munitions that are, have dud rates that are very, very low, I mean, very high, that are dangerous to civilians, number one. Number two, uh, the Ukrainians are running out of ammunition. Uh, the ammunition that is, they call them 155 millimeter weapons. This is a, this is a war relating to munitions and uh, the running out of those, that ammunition, and we're low on it. And so what I finally did, took the recommendation of the Defense Department to not permanently, but to allow for in this transition period where we get more 155 weapons, these shells for the Ukrainians, to provide them with a, something that has a very low dud rate. It's about one, I think it's 150, which is the least likely to be blowing. And it's not used in civilian areas. They're trying to get through those trenches and those, then stop those tanks from rolling. And so, uh, but it was not an easy decision, and it's not, we're not signatories to that, that agreement, but I, um, it took me a while to be convinced to do it. But the main thing is they either have the weapon to stop the Russians now from their, keep them from stopping the Ukrainian offensive through these areas, or uh, they don't, and I think they needed them. Let me ask you about China policy. Uh, recently, there have been announcements of new restrictions on Chinese uh, companies relating to cloud computing. The Chinese are now beginning to uh, make, put restrictions in place uh, on critical materials relating to Magic. semiconductors. Where the United States will keep doing things like this, the Chinese will start responding. And this goes on, or do you think there's a kind of stable point here where U.S.-China relations can be, as you have often said, competitive, but also, when necessary, cooperative? The answer is I think there's a stable point. But look, if you don't mind my saying, just before we went on air, we talked about things are changing around the world. China is in flux right now as well. China has enormous potential capacity but enormous problems as well. And, uh, and so uh, there's two things that I have tried to do in terms of our China policy. And by the way, I have met person to person with Xi Jinping more than any other world leader. 68 hours alone, he and I with an interpreter, back when I was vice president all the way through, because as you remember, it was clear he was gonna be president and there was, uh, it wasn't appropriate for the president of the United States, Barack Obama to be traveling the world with him, but I traveled 17,000 miles with him when he was vice president in China. And so we, we understand each other, I think, fairly well, number one. Number two, everything's changing. You know, you've heard me say it before, the world's at an inflection point. No matter what was happening, China is at a different place right now. Internally, internally, I'll give you an example. He often says to me, he, not often, he is on two occasions, called me and said, why am I criticizing what's going on in, with, uh, in Western China and slave labor, et cetera? And I said, remember you told me that for China to be able to be secure, it needs to have one leader, a united China from Taiwan to the Tibetan Plateau, and that's when China has always done well, going all the way back to the time when we had emperors. And I said, uh, and so for me not to talk about, and you told me for you not to talk about unity of China, it would be, you wouldn't be able to lead. I said, well, you, the United States is the most unique nation in the world. We are organized based on an idea, and I, for real, an I, only idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal, et cetera. We've never lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it. And for me, for American presidents to remain silent, on slave labor would be totally inconsistent. And so I think what I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm sorry to go on so long, is that I think there is a way to resolve, to establish a working relationship with China that benefits them and us. And the last thing I'll tell you on this is, I also called him after he had that meeting with, uh, with uh, the Russians with about you know, this new relationship, et cetera. And I said, this is not a threat, this is an observation. I said, since Russia went into Ukraine, 600 American corporations have pulled out of Russia. 
And you've told me that your economy depends on investment from Europe and the United States. And be careful, be careful. And so he- What did he say? He listened, he didn't, he didn't argue. And if you notice, he has not gone full bore in on Russia. He, is, he, he talks about you know, nuclear war would be a, a disaster. They, you know, there is such a thing as security that's needed anyway. So I, I, I think there's a way we can work through this. And that's why I spent so much time beefing up. I think if I told you three years ago, which I was, had written about in my, my notes, that I was going to get Japan d deeply involved, have them change their defense budget, have them work with, with not that I've done it, but them work with South Korea, work something out. We're going to put together the Quad, which is India, Australia, the United States, and Japan. I got a call from on that. He said, why are you doing that? I said, we're not doing that to surround you. We're doing that to maintain uh, stability in the Indian Ocean and, and in the South China Sea because we believe the rules of the road about what constitutes international airspace, what constitutes international space in the water, should be maintained. And uh, so I, I just think it's gonna take a little time, but, and where it goes depends a lot on what he's able to do internally in terms of his economy. Do um, you think he wants to replace, he wants China to replace the United States as the leading power, the defining power? Oh yeah, power I think he system. does. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident he wants to have the largest economy in the world and have a, uh, the largest military capacity in the world. Rewrite the rules of the international order? I think so. Not all of them, but he says, he pointed out to me, he said, we weren't there when those rules were written about international airspace and, and so on. And, uh, but I don't think he wants, he's looking for war, conflict, expansion of territory. And he, look, I, I sometimes say to my colleagues, I've spent over 180 hours talking with my NATO colleagues and European colleagues in person or on Zoom. I, I, I say to them, do you know anybody, any world leader who would trade places with Xi Jinping? Okay, I'll trade, I'll take their problems, you take mine. I don't know anybody who would. Because it's not that he, he's a bad guy or a good guy. The, the, the circumstances are enormously complicated. For example, you know, the, uh, the whole notion of, uh, um, you know, the, this new, ring road that's going to put around, they're going to invest in other nations. Well, it's ended up producing dead in a noose, you know. These countries are in real trouble. Uh, and so, but it requires us to be more responsible. The West, I've been pushing very hard to get our European colleagues to invest in infrastructure in Africa, in South America, in to generate the kind of growth that they should have and could have because we're the ones that caused the environmental problems. We clear cut everything, we, and now we're telling them, no, everybody slow up. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, I think there are positive answers to the dilemmas that exist without worrying about whether or not China's gonna rule the world. What will it take for Bibi Netanyahu to get? Well, first of all, uh, the uh, Israeli president is gonna be coming. We have other uh, contacts. I've been, as you, I think it's fair to say, uh, uh, an unyielding supporter of Israel for over, I've only been around a couple of years, but for as long as I've been around. And um, uh, Bibi, I think, is trying to work through how we can work through his existing problems in terms of his coalition. He has, I, I'm one of those who believes that Israel's ultimate security rests in a two-state solution. I think it's a mistake to think that uh, as some members of his cabinet, and this is one of the most extreme members of cabinets that I've, that I've seen, and I go all the way back to Golda Meir and all, you know, and, and uh, not that she was extreme, but I go back to that era. I think that, um, the fact that the Palestinian Authority has lost its credibility, not necessarily because of what Israel's done, just because it's, 
It just lost its credibility, number one. And number two, created a vacuum for extremism in the, among the Palestinians. The PLA, they are, there's some very extreme elements. So it's not all Israel now in the West Bank, all Israel's problem, but they are part of the problem. And particularly those individuals in the cabinet who say they have no right, to, we, we can settle anywhere we want, they have no right to be here, et cetera. And uh, I, I think uh, we, uh, we're talking with them regularly, trying to tamp down what's going on, and hopefully Bibi will continue to move toward moderation and changing the, the court. You've had tough words about Saudi Arabia um, from the start, uh, about the Khashoggi killing um, and things like that. You talked about needing a kind of new relationship. They've been pretty unyielding when you've asked them to pump more oil. They slashed oil recently. Now Saudi Arabia wants a defense treaty from the United States, promising that you will protect them, and they want civilian uh, nuclear capacity, which again, the US would have to provide. And in return, they would recognize Israel. Are you gonna do it? We're a long way from there. We got a lot to talk about. For example, um, in that trip I went, which was criticized for my going, um, a, a number of things have happened on that trip. On that trip, I was able to negotiate overflights of Israelis can now, Israeli aircraft can now overfly uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, number one. Number two, the price of oil is actually down, not up. And it's not because they have done one thing or the other, but the world's changing. Our policies relative to renewables are real. Number three, we found ourselves in a circumstance where the war in Yemen is essentially for a year now been, it's, it's, it's ended, not, it, the peace is being kept. So we're making progress in the region, um, and, uh, um, and it depends upon the conduct and what is asked of us for them to recognize Israel. Quite frankly, um, I, uh, I don't think they have much of a problem with Israel, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, and whether or not we would provide uh, a means by which they could have uh, civilian nuclear power and or um, be a, a guarantor of their security. That's, I think that's a little way off. Finally, Mr. President, um, you've often said when people ask you about your uh, age, uh, just watch me. And I think a lot of people do watch you and are impressed and they think you've been a great president. Uh, you've brought the economy back, uh, you've restored relations with the world, but many of these people do say, and these are ardent supporters of yours, the next thing he should do is step aside and let an, another generation of Democrats take the baton. Why are they wrong? Uh, well, let me say, not right or wrong, uh, it's, uh, look, to use the phrase again, I think we're at an inflection point. I think the world is changing, and I think I, uh, there is one thing that comes with age, if you've been honest about it your whole life, and that is some wisdom. I think we're on the cusp of being able to make significant positive changes in the world. Really, honest to God, do. You see what we've done in Europe. Europe's more united than it's ever been since World War II, end of World War II. You see what we've been able to do in the, in the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. We've united that part of the world, including the 50, basically 50 island nations that are participating. They're going to be here, by the way, shortly. Um, I think we're putting the world together in a way that is going to make things significantly, how can I say it, uh, more secure for people. Uh, we're uniting democracies, have the possibility of uniting democracies in a way that hadn't happened ever. Um, and so I, I think that whether it's the Far East, whether it's NATO, whether it's uh, Europe, whether it's what's going on in Africa, I think we have enormous opportunities. And, uh, and I think I, I just want to finish the job. And I think we can do that in the next six years. Mr. President, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.
Please join the Comma 8-hour orphanage projects across Africa.